We're counting down. Are we live? We are live. Okay. Not good. Okay. Okay. Welcome to Missions Monday across the street and around the world. Welcome. It's great to be with you again. Um, we're talking about missions and it's Monday. I'm excited because missions always excites me because really that is the extension of our faith. Missions is the extension of our faith. It's an opportunity to live beyond our relationship with God within our relationship with God. We have in studio with me, we have a contramassi. We have on Zoom, Pastor Adam, and we also have Lati as well. And today we're talking about, and I think we're doing a series on stories of faith, stories of faith where we have opportunities around the world to see God be faithful to people, but also to see God's people walk in faithfulness with God. So we'll begin a program with a devotion by Pastor Adam. So Pastor Adam, take it away. Thanks, uh, Pastor Ronaldo. Um, this is a great subject, stories of faith, and um, really good for missions because we fit in that, um, maybe we could call it that section within Christianity that we could call it faith missions is our, I'm going to call it our style brand, what God has given us personally as a, as a ministry, faith missions. For us, it's more than just a work of man. It's more than um, a, a, uh, a corporation or something like that, but it's individuals and local assemblies stepping out really in faith um, because of his faithfulness. Um, I want to maybe just share a few thoughts on um, from John chapter 8 um, uh, that I think relate in some way. We have um, a confrontation that Jesus has with some of his enemies and they're, they don't understand him. John 1, they don't understand him. They call him light darkness. Um, he's in a very dark time. Um, Isaiah 53, verse 2. He's in a very dark time. Very hard hearted um, group of religious people are there. And he is sent on a mission when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. Um, in Kenneth Weiss's translation, he says, I am, it's translated sent on a mission. And he deliberately puts that in there because Jesus Christ is on a mission. He's not here to live. He's here to die. He's here to express God's life and seek and save that which is lost. And in this confrontation with his enemies, he um, he starts off in two, kind of two verses that I want to pull out. One is um, verse 32. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And then the other is verse 44, um, that you're of, the fa of your father, the devil. He abode not in the truth. Um, there's no truth in him when he speaks. He speaks a lie. He speaks from his own. For he is the liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe it not. Um, very, very interesting thing that as a missionary, Really, when we talk about faith and the faith, it's connected to a person, the faithfulness of God, but it's also connected to truth and it's connected to a message that is is believed. I remember in my first year of Bible college reading, um, really the account of George Mueller in his um, autobiography, uh, which was a transcription of just his his uh, kind of a diary of faith, where he was writing, you know. Um, his needs and his prayer and his conviction for him personally, not to make his requests known to man, but to God alone. And then seeing the fulfillment of God's faithfulness in, in it. And with all the lies that are in the world perpetrated by Satan, um, they, they always go against faith. And I remember just being so stirred in my heart that and excited and stirred into like, can I believe God for myself? 
and specifically for my call and in a call of faith in missions and something kind of being born in um watchman he calls it in hebrews 11 1 and 2 you know faith being the substantiation with uh, of, mm. of things hoped for um just like my eyes substantiate things that are visible and my ears substantiate things that are audible so in my human spirit i have an innate ability given at the point of salvation to substantiate truth by faith that is not seen and that's really you know Christ was the embodiment of truth. And there's just so many uh, lies, you know, in, in, in the world. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 5, God tells him to go out and seek for a man. One man. Just look for a man. And um, he goes out and he cannot find a man. And he goes among the poor. And in verse 4, he looks for the poor. And, they, and they've, they, they, they're not believing truth. They, they don't know God's way. And he says, maybe it's because they're poor. Then in verse 5, he goes to the rich, to the big man, very Zambian expression there. And he goes to the big man in the city, those that have money, those who actually intellectually know God's way. But they say in verse 5, we've broken off God's bonds. What a lie. Isn't, isn't it amazing how, how many, as you go into like many countries, especially rich countries, that the, the, the lie that Satan has per perpetrated, that God is there to kind of like, constrain you and put you in bondage and like hold you back from your real good life you know and someone tell, tell me that you know my problem is i just i can't say no to the good life and I'm, I'm looking i'm like it's really not a good life it's all a lie you know when the wife is gone and when the marriage is broken and when you know like you don't have a true friend in the world i was driving to houston the other day and just looking at you know you, you see all the little dots of the houses on the side on the map as you're going i'm thinking how many of these people are just so lost so so lost so heartbroken like we mm -hmm. said on, on sunday night how he heals the brokenhearted and christ is there with like truth you know, it's and and it, and he's not there, and and Satan has done a masterful job of lying to man about God since the Garden of uh, of, of Eden. Um, you know, where he, he where he's just misrepresenting who God is. <clears throat> That's a big part of missions, really, just coming. And we we sometimes like to balance like grace and truth, or you know, love and truth. But actually, truth is the most liberating. He says it right. Uh, Thirty. <laughs> Of course, it should be in grace and in God's heart and in love. But truth in itself, let's not like dilute it, right? Mm -hmm. Truth is the most liberating thing. It sets me so free from the lie. Think of Hebrews 2, um, where, where they're kept their whole lifetime, verse 15, in, in, in bondage to the fear of death. And truth just, just comes in. I remember uh, uh, he's now a pastor, but a Bible college student in 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 zambia from another country coming up and, and saying you, you, you didn't know any of our our you know local fears of juju and and witchcraft and things like this but by speaking finished work nuggets finished work truth we were liberated from that we were getting set free from things you didn't even know about because that's the nature of truth and truth applied by the holy spirit it sets you free and it and truth just leaves you with one choice. Do you believe it or not? Right? You're reading George Mueller's book and you're like, it, it, like, is this like is he gonna be faithful to me or not? Right. And I remember just um, I remember leaving, <laughs> you know, leaving my second employment, you know, getting on a plane, arriving um, in Zambia, August 2004, and just saying, God, like, I'd like, could you, can I trust you? Maybe you could keep me here for even a season, maybe for like five years, you could, you could supply for my needs. And maybe for me, and we have a whole spectrum of people in the ministry, you know, from people who make their needs very much known to those that like suffer in silence. But I, I just thought like, let me try this. And God, is, is, it, is it possible that I could never maybe make my needs known to man, but make my needs known mm -hmm. to you alone? And for me, I, I, that was just like a thing. I, I said, let me just personally try that and believe you for it. And it was amazing to see year one, year two, year three, and and lean cows and fat cows. Years where you know 
It was tough. Mm -hmm. And years where we were living on our tithe, mm -hmm. sorry, living on 10% and giving 90% to the ministry and building buildings. And, you know, just God through it all, just showing like I can be trusted. And this is the reality. Another word for truth is, is reality. Mm -hmm. How Satan loves to lie to people about, about, he he, he 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 doesn't want them to know about the love of God. You know, this he, he makes it it's it's totally foreign to them. He doesn't want them to know about God first loving us. First John four verse verse nineteen. Yet he doesn't he he he, 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 hold, he does not want people to, to know truth, truth, baptismal regeneration and all the lies that are out there, the confusion. It is out there, and it leave, you meet a lot of confused people. We had one guy come in the church about a year ago, completely confused, like I'm, like ask like asking the most like questions that wouldn't be tolerated in the average church. Mm -hmm. He was he was part of a church mm -hmm. that was seeing demons in every corner and signs and wonders every week. And he was like ready to be committed to an insane place, and you know, and and just completely out of his mind. With and and we just sort of like answered some questions and ignored other questions and and didn't really do much but give truth line upon line precept upon precept and then faith works by love and faith starts to come in where truth it leaves you with the option do I believe it or not and then faith is born and then the healing another man came to me and said I knew that guy and I went to a church that had signs and wonders every week. But I've never seen a miracle like this. I've never seen a guy transform like this. And now he's really an integral, you know, part of, uh, part of the church. Truth. I remember uh, evangelizing outside of uh, teachers. <laughs> I remember walking to. We and what one year we couldn't afford to could, uh, rent for the church. So I remember walking into a, a school classroom and uh, a, a high school and saying, "Can I speak to the?" headmistress may about maybe borrowing your classroom for for church and they, they they said no we don't we don't rent out to churches and i had the right brilliant idea to say but bible college and they said okay we'll check with her and she said to us she came in come on in we love it you know this could be our tithe to god and and ended up giving it to us rent free for uh for uh two years i remember evangelizing outside uh, it was school before a service and uh, a, a man coming up to me and, and just listening and listening and said, you know, I was ready to take my life today. And I met you and I, you, that, that doesn't have, I, you know, sometimes we hear missionary stories and we tell missionary stories and people yeah. put it, put, they kind of like think that's the everyday of mission field, of the mission yeah, field exactly. and it's not, and they get there and they're disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I, and I don't want that to be there, but the, the reality of everyday truth, mm. truth, kind of truth in my heart and we become lovers of truth jeremiah said in that chapter where he was looking for the rich looking at the poor and he said there's none that seeks after truth in jeremiah 5 verse 2 the tribulation will be a time when the people that are left behind are people who did not receive a love for the truth in first thessalonians second thessalonians 2 verse 10 but we meet them you know and we meet them and god leads them to us you meet a lydia and it's not every day that Paul meets Lydia, but when he meets her, she's a person who whose heart the Lord opens to truth and then faith is born. And that faith connects with the truth and allows God to work in and through them. So, you know, thank God for these um, stories of faith that are based on truth. Amen. Wonderful thoughts, Pastor Adam. A lot to dig into there. I like um, what you said towards the end about how stories of faith, um, there's two types of stories of faith. There's the one you mentioned, which are the extraordinary. Right. Like the Red Sea moments. Uh, they're not regular. I mean, and most of the time when preachers get up or missionaries get up and they talk about God moving, most of the time it's the, it's the Red Sea moments. You know, I was arrested, but somehow the back, the jail door was open and I went out the back door and all of a sudden the man that wanted to arrest me, he's down in the jail and I'm now free, which is a miraculous. Right. But then there's also faith stories that are not so demonstrative. They're not so Red Sea-ish. They're more like manna. They're more like every day. Uh, case in point, I remember um, 
being in the 90s in Uganda and not having enough money for malaria medicine. And I just said, God, I'm going to trust you. I don't have the money for malaria medicine and I don't want to get malaria. But I remember uh, I didn't really ask people to send me money for malaria medicine. I just said, I'm going to trust you. And God gave me a weird <laughs> word, garlic. And I kind of laughed at it because before I went on the mission, I, I was not a, a, a spice person or a vegetable person, still not really a vegetable person. But I remember saying, okay, that's what the Holy Spirit gave me. So I ate like three cloves of garlic every day. I was sweating. I was smelling. I looked, I was walking garlic. I was in the room. You, you knew I had been there. I had left. But that <laughs> wisdom God gave me, the, 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 I call it the garlic miracle. I never got malaria the whole year. But it was like, it was a quiet miracle that to me was life changing because I didn't want to get malaria, but it was a quiet thing. I kind of like, I like the loud miracles, the, the water gets spread, thousands, someone's healed of cancer, and that happens. But then I like the quiet miracles, little stories in my heart where I, I see God faithful to me in such a personal way. Those are the ones that resonate, that don't make the pulpit. Those are the ones that resonate, that don't make the newsletter. Those are the ones that resonate, that don't necessarily even make the testimonies. But you know deep in your heart that you're in a work of God and he's faithful. He's faithful. And those are the ones really, Pastor Adam and Leti and, and Akacha, those are the ones that stitch together your moments, mm -hmm. your moments of, of, of walking with God. It's these little things that you just laugh about like, wow, all that time. I never had to worry about that, you know. I never got sick, but that, 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 that you know, as opposed to, okay, you know what? Um, the money for the plane ticket came in miraculously, and those happen. Yeah. I like the little ones too, because yeah. those are the ones that God, the Holy Spirit, brings back. Remember, mm -hmm. I kept you there. I kept right, you there. Right. You know, brilliant stuff. Like Latia, I was thinking about you. You, you've come from Europe. You've gone to America for Bible school. You've gone back to the mission field in Europe. Share with me a couple of stories of, of, give me a big one, like a Red Sea one, like da -da -da -da! one built for Hollywood, yeah. and then a little one, a little one, like a, a one that really doesn't seem like much, maybe, that they wouldn't make a movie about, but it moves you. It moves you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, let me pick... Uh... Okay, I start with the big one or a small one? Whatever, you got. let's go big. Go big or go home, Leti. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I think I can share the, um, I like what you said, really the small one or the, the, the one that make a bigger impact on, on my heart, but I, I cannot not say that God has done big things. Uh, I think also because that sometimes you need something uh, uh sometimes it's encouraging to your faith uh, so anyway so maybe i can share um, i mean on the mission field we had some uh, so for engagement and wedding that was like um actually to bring us on the mission field and to bring us back from the mission field from benin uh now we are on the mission field in uh, the switzerland too uh, obviously uh god did some big things so let me share like uh, we went to, in 2010 to eurocon and paul was already in uh, benin and i was in paris at that point i graduated from bible school and uh, we were uh, about to uh, we were about to get engaged and we went to eurocon we spoke with pastor shibili pastor shara pastor Brian Lynch, and they say, hey, why, why do, don't you get married this summer? And we were like in March. So we're like, what? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so I like, we had no money and either, uh, none of us uh, had money. So we had like a literal argument before the session <laughs> because for the, we, were, we were saying, well, let's just do a, something super small. Like no, no, no need to do something big. And I was like, well, you know, I have a big family. I don't know. I think it will be dishonoring if we don't invite everybody. And so anyway, we went to the session and, and Pastor Shara was uh, speaking on that. The message was, who will roll the stone away? And they asked the question, the ladies, but they want. 
And also the other example he used is like, uh, he said that many, they like to uh, walk on water, but they don't want to step out of the boat. So you cannot do both. So if you want to uh, walk on water, you, you have to step out of the boat. So basically after that, I remember we didn't even talk about it. Both of us, we, I think we, we realized, okay, let's go for it. And let's see how God will provide. So we went to Northern Ireland from there, from uh, Eurocon. And uh, we got engaged, and God like uh, God like gave me a little devotional to to make me ready. He said, <laughs> "You surprised me," and uh, and he was saying that God uh, wants us also to accept like the explosion of joy He does in our life, and not just like uh, maybe the suffering, whatever. So anyway, we got engaged, and the next day we had no idea, and only the person that told us that knew actually. No one else in the family or anyone knew. The person, the person in Northern Ireland told us that uh, he would give us ten thousand pounds for a wedding. And we're like, wow. okay. Wow. And then two days later, I'm back in Paris, and uh, and we and we uh, and uh, Paul went back to the mission field. Then anyway, the, our wedding. We had the ceremony in Bort- in Baltimore, a uh, stateside wedding, and then. Uh, on uh, in uh, July, Pastor Sherry came to do a wedding. It was amazing, and we received so many gifts from little gifts from so many people that, like personally, I was overwhelmed, concerned about how I'm going to thank them all. It was like so much, so much cash that the bank was saying, like, where does that money come from? From so many <laughs> currency and and, oh, and they were like asking us <laughs> so so many questions. <laughs> And then I remember the day, the the day of the wedding. People were like, some people they 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 say okay, yes, the, the, to the invitation. But I had the impression some they say yes because thinking okay, poor missionaries, uh, let's go to their wedding, you know. And so they came and they were so surprised. Many of them like, wow, what, how did you pay for that? And we we told them like, really, was it, it's God, really, it, it's God. And so after the, the night, uh, the fir- after the first night, we had to give some cash to one person to give it to two other person. And uh, we couldn't uh, uh, withdraw because uh, we uh, maxed out the plateau, you know. So we counted like uh, in the urn, the money we that what was put there and we counted the cash and we put the check on the side and the cash and we counted the cash. And it was exactly exactly seven seven twenty what we needed to give. Wow! So and then we gave it, and we went to and with all the money we've got, we we were able to pay the, for the wedding, and then also give go six months to Baltimore and like uh, go on the on in Benin and leave six months from from that. So it was like wow! You know, it was it was to me it was like God like uh, saying yeah this is of me you know you can trust me. That was mm. like, uh, for me, that was a big deal. You notice, let's see, how when God is big like that, you don't have a lot of words. There's not these paragraphs yeah. of praise and worship. It's kind of brief. It's numbing, actually. It just kind of shuts your mouth, and you just kind of sit back, and you just say, God is here, God is with me, or God is faithful, or he did it again. Like I remember one time God came through for something and I'm the only person in the room that knew he, he it was him. And they're all asking me, how did that happen? I'm just saying to myself, he did it again. He did it again. He did it again. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, there's part of you that doesn't expect it, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. yet he always does it. So you're all, you, it never gets old. You never really don't get surprised. The faithfulness of God is so extraordinary it is so beyond everything else in your life that's not faithful that it sticks out. And every time he, he does it, you're like, again? Right? But that's huge. Wow. So the foundation of your marriage was the with the faithfulness of God. Wow. You carry that the rest of your life. That's incredible. That's incredible. Wow. I'm going to come back to you for the small one. I'll, I'll give you a second to think yeah. about the small one. But yeah. I want to ask Akasha the same one. Give me the big one. Oh, the big one. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to, like, talk uh, more, like, I was reminded of something. Like, you shared, like, how God 
is like faithful like it doesn't have to be a red you know red sea moment like mm -hmm. a big thing it can be like in the little details something mm -hmm. very small and God, like that ministers to you and like this morning i was reading my devotional uh, by also chambers and it was on faith mm. and this is exactly what he said was like as believers sometimes we are so desperate to like keep on hearing from god for every situation that we like we lose our focus from not actually wanting god but we just want the answer mm. to our situation mm. and that's what we're going after but it's not god but like that made so much sense to me because it's like our faith is beyond what we can see or like do or like think you know and like i was just thinking about it today and like this is what came to my mind was like faith is not only exercised in our answered prayers but is always exercised in our willingness to keep going after god mm. you know mm. and like it's our willingness uh, like even though i don't see it happening my mind is still fixed on God because that's where my faith comes from. Mm -hmm. And like in my life, I I would I can give you a smaller one. I don't know if there's a bigger one or not, but I think the most recent one for me, it's like very small. But I was in Eurocon and I didn't know how I'm gonna like book my tickets or mm -hmm. anything for the whole trip. Yeah. And it was it was not a lot, but it was, and I did not have enough in my account. And then I just prayed, like, okay, God. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I really want to go. And you've told me that I have to go. So I'm going to go. I'm going to obey. And I had exactly the amount like in my actual account and in my other account. And I combined those two and it was the exact amount of amount like money I needed to buy my plane tickets. So I do that. Now I'm at Eurocon already. And, you know, you go out, you hang out, you're getting coffee and everything. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to be spending more money here, you know. And I'm like, again, I look at my account and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go live by faith. That one, two nights, I just couldn't sleep because I was just so anxious. Like, wow. okay, God, how, like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, like you told me to be here. I'm here and I have peace about that, but I have nothing right now. So two nights I couldn't sleep. But that one night I just like look at my account and I said, okay, God, you're a God who provides, and I'm just not going to look at this again. If you want, you will like, you will bless me. I, I sleep that night, and then next morning I wake up and I go about my day. Like during afternoon, sometime around like two or three o'clock, I receive an email on my phone, and then um, I see that it was my check for like for my like money that was credited to my account and it was enough for me for like that whole week wow. so like it was it's like these little stories where god is like building faith foundation in your life mm -hmm. and you like build on that foundation and like you keep going forward with god in that and like you just see his faithfulness mm. yeah isn't it interesting how the big story the big thing right <laughs> that impresses us yeah. god can impress you when he does something like that, yeah. it impresses you. But really the engine of your faith is the little small consistent nudges. Like yeah. you're in my will, this is still me, this is still working, mm -hmm. this is still going. And yeah. those are the, that's why the best stories, to be honest with you, the ones you don't tell. <laughs> yeah. The ones, well, the ones where you're like, uh, uh, that's not so special, that's not, that, that's not gonna move the needle. But in you, it's like written on the chambers of your heart. Mm. It's like, yeah, mm. this thing works. God is still in it, you know? Mm. Um, I was mm. thinking about a, um, a time in, uh, I was living overseas. And I just remember, um, it wasn't, it, you know how you pray for materialistic things where mm. God is faithful. And I wanna expand the conversation a little bit mm. beyond just what you get to show that God is faithful. I appreciate now the faithfulness of God mm -hmm. with his presence. Mm -hmm. I remember Christmas, I want to say 2001, we were in South Africa and my support that month was extremely low. Mm -hmm. It might have been $40 US, very low. And, and I was spending Christmas in South Africa. So I remember not having anything, didn't get a phone call from family, just Perfect. nothing. And I remember, uh, thank you, Pastor Adam, for the Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, 22 years later. Thank you, sir. So 
I remember uh, there was a family in the church. And I said, I'm not going to sit here and sulk and be by myself. I'm going right. to go be with them. Uh, we, we, Brian it was an Indian family in the church. And I went with them. And they didn't have money at the time. So this is what they did. They took boxes and they wrapped them up as presents. And we just pretended like there was something inside. Mm. So we all pretend, whatever, we just would give the box, the empty boxes to people. Nothing's inside of it. Awesome. I got you this, I got you this. And it was the over the top celebration. Like, oh my God, <laughs> where'd you go? So we did this for like an hour. <laughs> and I remember it was so hilarious. There was joy. Uh, and then we had beans for Christmas. Uh, we didn't have, we couldn't even have we couldn't even afford rice. We just had beans. So we had a bowl of beans and a bunch of empty boxes. And it was the best Christmas ever. Wow. And the presence of God was there. I said to myself, mm -hmm. God was faithful. He he didn't supply me with cash or with presents, mm -hmm. but he supplied me with his character towards me. And I'll never forget that yeah. Christmas. And that's not that's not a great newsletter story. I thought one that's gonna so People are not signing up for Bible school hearing that story. No one's buying visas or getting passports to go on the mission with that story. But for me, that was a story of faith because God was faithful to me at a time when I sensed that nobody else would. It was an amazing, amazing time. And you remember that, that historical faith. Yeah. Um, I often think about Israel. Whenever they would renounce, whenever they would recount their story of faith, their story of faith with people, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the God the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they would say this to each other, and they're giving each other stories of faith. Remember Abraham, how faith God was faithful to him, and he was faithful to God. Remember Isaac, how God was faithful to him, and he. That's a story of faith, uh -huh. and there wasn't anything so tangible necessarily, but part of our story of faith, I think, is a relationship of faith. Mm -hmm. And in the relationship of faith, it may not, that's what makes those blessings so special, those materialistic things like I was walking with God in this and I was full of doubt and if borderline suspicion. <laughs> you ever been suspicious of God? Borderline, is, is God going to do this? Is yeah. it going to happen? And you're just doubt, you're full of doubt. You're like, I don't know. Hmm. Then, then here's the other thought that comes in, Pastor Adam. You're like, maybe it's not God's will. So there's always that in your story of faith mm. that, and then you, you try to calm yourself down and say, it's okay. You know, it's okay. Maybe it's not God's will. When what we're really saying is because it's not happening yet, or it's not happening the way I want it, the safer answer is it's not God's will rather than me just waiting for God. You could say, maybe it's not God's will for me to be here. Or you could say, well, maybe it's will his will for me to be here and just enjoy the beans with these people. Right. That's it. You know what I mean? <laughs> when you're with the people, yeah. Yeah. you're not thinking about beans and empty boxes. You're thinking about, this is hilarious. This is like Christmas night, 8 o'clock at night, and you're laughing. And then, then the absurd comes in like, hey, I got your new car in this size box. Really? This is this is a new car? Probably can't. Probably can't. <laughs> Wrong answer. It was hilarious. And it, with, with nothing. Yeah. A faithful God with nothing can be life changing. You know, Pastor Ronaldo, um, she what she said about Oswald Chambers really triggered the thought that you know I, our thinking when we come into Christianity changes from you know I I'm living my life my way for me by me through me you know mm. where I want to go your self directed self effort and then you know God is this sort of you know, like you're thankful for salvation, but in addition to salvation, you, you, you have this benefit of like, now he can help me live my life for me with my way. And he, yes. can, he can. And so when you hear the idea of faith, sometimes it's through the lens of like, okay, now, you know, God can help me turn over a leaf, get my life straight. God can, yeah. like, he's on my team, kind of yes. like Roger is doing his thing and like, mm -hmm. Are you with us or with them? Like, I think God's just like, I'm with you. Yeah. Get, get in line, you know? <laughs> but, but I mean, and that's a, there is a measure of that. But then growing out of that, we, we start to realize, like, I'm being taken to where I don't naturally want to go. And actually, 
it's not so much faith in him for my problem. It's mm. like faith in him for his problem. Mm. Like this is actually his problem mm -hmm. you know, to solve. And then there's more of like a rest in, in my in my trust where I, mm. you know, I remember at, uh, at, at the place with our visa issues, which was no issue when I was single, you know, like. No problem. Hey, yeah. visa, you know, having a fight with immigration to get my visa and I'm in, you know, extension number 48. Uh, no problem because, you know, if I get deported, there's <laughs> nothing. But when, I, when my wife came, that suddenly became an issue. You know, oh, my gosh, I'm putting her in this situation. And then my prayer life went through the roof. And I'm going, like, God, would, I need your help for me to get her and then I remember him just putting me in a place where it's like, yeah, this is my problem and just resting. Like if this is, mm -hmm. if, I, if he doesn't solve this, like he, yeah, maybe he, he, I knock, but then he's got to open it. Otherwise, like, Lord, you know, if you don't give me one, fine, we just go somewhere else. No problem. Mm -hmm. This is your problem to solve. And it was at that point where we, we met the, where we, we went into the immigration office, you know, met a woman who mistakenly handed me my file. They weren't supposed to hand me my file. And I realized, you know, the, the, the country, the you know, third world um, immigration service don't have many computers, but they got these paper files and they've connected all, I've got like all these different passports and it's all there in one person. And it found like a note where someone had given an evil report, like this, this guy probably wouldn't even afford to pay for it to keep himself or whatever and take money from the locals or something. And um, the woman said, why don't you just go and see the head of immigration? He's right there. He's in, in town today. And, you know, walked into his office. This is after like five years of fighting and, and, all, and all sorts and heartache and, and uh, non-Red Sea moments. And uh, just hit it off with a guy. Um, you know, he's, I said, look, we're, 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 we're not, we're not, we don't, we haven't ever taken a dollar off of local people here god, you know god keeps us here we're volunteering and he just wrote a little note and it was over just like that you know <laughs> and um it's precious when when i don't see god as being on my team to help me with my faith getting him to budge but yeah. rather that my faith is in his faithfulness that he blesses his plan right mm -hmm. mm. Uh, yeah. wow. i like that i like how you brought out the story of faith is not just the response of God, but also my response to God. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes things, and, th and that would change my definition of a story of faith. Um, that's not so romantic and not so Hollywood movie-like, but my response to God, because ultimately whatever I'm facing, God want, is allowing it to happen to elicit a response of faith from me. God is always drawing faith out of me. He's put faith in me to draw it out of me through his plan and through his work. He's drawing faith out of me, you know? So it, it's, it's shocking the great stories and the little stories. Like the time you and I were in Zambia and um, we were living in a hotel, the soccer hotel. Was it 56 days or 54? But anyway, we were, we were living in, and I remember walking in the post office and I remember we couldn't open a church bank account without an address, yeah. a PO box. You can get a location without it. Yes. <laughs> we, couldn't, we had a, a hotel, they said, you can't use that. And we couldn't open a PO box without a location. So you couldn't do one without the other and we had neither. So I remember walking into the post office on Cairo Road, standing in the middle of a sea of people. Everyone knows where they're going and I have no idea where I'm going. So I just, I look, I look touristy. I'm just looking at the ceiling, looking around like, okay, God, how does this work? Um, and then finally, what's interesting is I just prayed right there. I just said, okay, God, help me. I don't know what I'm doing. And I, I, you know what I need to do, but I don't know what I'm doing. And then I prayed the prayer and I lowered my head. And then I turned around and the first person that walks up to me, the first person walking past, I said, do you know where the PO boxes are? They said, yeah, I run the department. Then they walked me up four flights of stairs. I would have never found the place. There was no signage. There was no nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a little dirty office in the back. And they, and then I said, what are you here for? We talk. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. Here's a P.O. box. Go get your account. And when you get addressed, just come back to me later. And that's and to this day, we still have the same P.O. box 20-some uh, yeah. years later. But it's amazing how 
part of my story of faith is not so much the championing of God in my situation, mm. but also my response to God in the situation. And that word dependence really comes in. I like what you said, that I don't want to filter my response to God based on a result. Mm -hmm. Okay, why is God faithful? Because He was. He, he, there was a result in my situation. Maybe God doesn't respond to my situation the way I wanted to, yes. but is he still God? What is my response? Yes, that's mm. good. Yeah. Latia, you ready with my story for me? Yeah. My little one, I know you're about, you've got 400 little ones. You've got a, a file. Yeah. yeah. you got a file. Where is one I can share, but it's really like imprinted in me. But uh, you prefer one from Switzerland or one from Benin? Or I one from Bible school, a small one? Uh, all three. Okay. So uh, I remember in Bible school, I uh, exactly what Pastor Adams uh, shared about um, uh, George Muller. I remember when I was 16, I heard Pastor Shibili coming in France and he said, hey, read missionary biography. If you don't speak English, learn English. It seemed not to <laughs> speak English and be in this ministry and I was like oh my gosh and and then he said you know it's good to read missionary biography but at one point I want to leave it and when I came home I thought yeah actually I want to leave it too and when I went to Bible school I also decided in my heart uh, that I would like this I, I would try God I don't know if you're supposed to do that but I, I, I thought I'm going to test God and not tell anybody um, what I need and see if I can uh, depend on it. Because if I'm going to to live that way, I want I want God to you know, I want it to be real. So I remember like uh, the first year I was in a dorm and all little things I would not tell anybody, but I would like, uh, for example, one time it was just like. Um, Everybody had a, had a banquet dress and I prayed for the tickets and, and they came uh, three of them, three different ways. But then what touched me was like, Melinda came and was like, hey, do you have a, I was praying for a banquet dress and I prayed that it would be decent, elegant and blue. And also <laughs> I was like, uh, it was like the texture I prayed. And Melinda, she showed up and one day and we went to the prayer meeting, she said, hey, do you have a banquet dress? I was like, uh, well, uh, not yet. And she said, hey, I, I, I have one for you if you want. I said, what color is it? She said, like, well, the blue, I think it will fit you well. So it was just, a, you know, a, a blink, like a wink of God. Like I was, <laughs> it was just when, and then he sued me and I thought like, you know, it was like God providing the tickets and then I could give it to somebody else so I could invite the guy and not the reverse. And then I, I, I got the dress and it was just, you know, I saw that it was God, God telling me, yeah, yeah, I'm with you, you know, you wow. just, it's a little thing, but for me, it was a big thing, you know? Yeah. And then, and then in Benin, it was like one time it was Christmas too. And, uh, we, we decided we never told anybody about our needs and our family. We knew they would send us money straight away if, uh, they knew our situation sometimes. <laughs> But uh, I, I made a little list, a list of some things we really needed at the end of December. And it was uh, around Christmas. And there was like, we needed Omo, you know, like the wash thing. Soap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> soap, soap for the wash, for, uh, the wash uh, of clothes. Then, uh, uh, what else? Pasta. I wanted eggs. And I, I just I made a little list. I don't remember uh, everything that was there, but... There is this this lady that showed up. No nobody gave us uh, no locals gave us anything at that point, mm -hmm. and they just uh, sent uh, their chauffeur and they gave us a bag and in it there was exactly my list, exactly my wow. list plus ten thousand CFA, and and for me it was really it was the best Christmas gift because it was just so exactly and I was. <laughs> I looked, I looked at Paula and I was crying. I was like, hey, I think that's my favorite. That's my, they would be my favorite gift, <laughs> my Christmas <laughs> gift. And, and the other day we, we thought we spoke about it again. So it was, you know, wow. and, and here in uh, Geneva, when we arrived, uh, we, we uh, did the summer harvest and we didn't know we would end up in Switzerland. 
And so we we are left for uh, the summer harvest with uh, only uh, summer clothes. Some uh, clothes are so a little warmer, but no uh, winter winter clothes. So basically, long story short, God like as a uh, stay in Switzerland, he showed us and we're like, oh man, that would be hard. <laughs> we have been out of system for so long, that would be hard. And so that was such a big thing to accept, but God was like, go ahead, go ahead, we'll go forward. And we spent two months in the church. I mean, not that people didn't want to, but because it was strategic, we had internet and everything. And so anyway, we, at one point, like we went to one lady she left us use their um, uh, house for a month and until Christmas. And we had to leave like the day before Christmas and we stay one week with my sister and then go provide an apartment for us. But when we left that place, we didn't have money, barely money, like uh, no money for to buy anything. It's, it's, sorry to for the, it's not so clear, but like there was this guy that lent a coat to Paul, a very uh, warm coat, uh, coat, and he said, "Oh, actually, I, he went to pick us up, and he he needed this coat to go skiing, and he just dropped us somewhere." And I was like, "We went to the church, we called, we got the apartment miraculously," and we're like, "Okay, God wants us here," and and I was like so kind of disappointed because this guy was like really rich, and you know, and I was like so disappointed that he he wanted his coat back because I, I was looking at Paul like, <laughs> you know, and somebody else lent a coat to Paul, but it was like this super old coat with like big uh, stains and the thing was coming out and it looked like a clown. And I was like, oh man, God, I want to go forward, but <laughs> even looking at him, I want to cry, you know? Oh. So anyway, I remember we went to the, we went to the, for one, uh, two, a uh, few hours, we went to the church and we've made some phone calls and God gave me like this verse, like uh, Psalm 46, one, you know, I'm a very present help in time of need. Yes. Uh, you are a refuge and a very present help in time of need. So I thought, okay, this guy is not a present help, you know. He was a help. <laughs> Actually, he helped us a lot. But And I was like, God, okay, okay, you need, you see, we need codes. <laughs> Actually, we need codes. And then we decided we went to, we went soul winning, like, uh, and as we went soul winning, this guy called us again. And he said, hey, where are you? And we told him, well, we are in, in the town, in the city. And he said, actually, I forgot to tell you, my mom that you you housed the house for, well, wait, she housed it, really. <laughs> she went to US. And uh, she left us, like, left me some money to uh, get you some, uh, some meal. Actually, we didn't have time to do that. But if you want, I give you the money. Or if you want to use it in peak performance, I could get some codes for, for, for yourself if you want it. And so he basically said, go, go, my sister worked there, peak pick some codes if you want do you need some codes because uh, you remember that uh he, he got the code from paul <laughs> and so i uh, thought it was just for me it was like so we went and we got like two super codes and uh, and she said no no uh, don't pay anything he will come he will uh, pay the thing and, and he added something and for me like i still have the codes and it was like just <laughs> it was just really god god saying hey welcome to switzerland i am your god <laughs> People <laughs> might have money here, but you, you know, I am your God. Don't depend mm -hmm. on them. Keep depending on me. Trust me. And, you know, so. Beautiful. Yeah. I like the fact that you just, you discarded the guy as a provision. He's not the present help. <laughs> and then the no, very, but you know what I mean? The very you guy you I mean? got, the very guy you dismissed, the stone that was he rejected. God used. <laughs> God used. <laughs> he ends up being the very guy. He ends up being the very guy. Isn't it interesting that with someone that you automatically dismiss as being used by God in your life is mm -hmm. the very person that God uses in your life? So be careful. Yeah. When you start dismissing people, God's like, oh, that one. He, yeah, he, he but, I needed, I, I, but I just needed to see the that it's not him. It was God through him. Uh -huh. like, okay, God, I got, I got the lesson. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. disqualified I... him, and God's like, <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't disqualify God. <laughs> 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 
I got the total less than that. Yeah. And every time you see that coach, you don't think of him. No, you think of God. Yes. I think of him too. <laughs> He might be listening, you know. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, this is not against you. Well, the good thing is you didn't say his name. You didn't say you didn't give his address or anything. Good job, Pati. <laughs> you covered him well. <laughs> okay, Akashi, you got my story for me now. The big one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm thinking like this is this is like a true story. It's personal, but I'll share it. Um, I think two years or uh, probably three years ago like um we had like this challenging time in our family back home and um everything was like very blank like it was like you are living in a moment of darkness and um i wish i could give more details but yeah um but like in those times i really realized like how much god is faithful like every side during that time every area or like everything that was happening was completely like like it was seen as okay god's like like where are you god i don't see you at all and like all my family members we're all praying on our knees every day for something to change and and like it was it was just like not an easy time that you go through as a family but mm -hmm. that's all you have but in that you find God, you find yeah. God on your knees, you find God, like even when you're just playing out loud worship music. And um, it was a period of two months or three months and that that whole situation was continuing. And we just, we kept fighting with God or like, like just asking God, like, okay, God, like, please help us. like. And we know that there were people that were praying for us in ch back home in church. Uh, our family friends were praying for us. And um, but that in that whole situation, I, I, I realized that, OK, like this is this is not my battle to fight. This is not my family's battle to fight. Like God has a purpose in this and it's going to go beyond. And when that situation was completely over, this is a testimony like we saw like how God saved other souls. Mm. Like there were souls that were being saved in those three months mm. in a place where you cannot imagine to be or like your family member to be in. But souls were being saved and God had a bigger purpose behind that whole situation for three months. Mm. And I think that's like the biggest Red Sea situation I could mm -hmm. say a biggest Red Sea moment for me in my mm -hmm. life wow like because it was so personal to me and you see a family member going through it mm -hmm. alone with no help anything but prayer and this is and it reminds me of like you know um Paul's life as well like he had nothing but he he was alone himself uh, in his ministry but also when he was like in the prison you know mm -hmm. writing all these episodes and all he had was his faith and his love for God. <laughs> and that's all that kept him going. And now we read all of these episodes and it's changing life. Like the gospel has the power <laughs> to transform life. Yes. And like we see that today and our lives are transformed because of one man's faith. And like when we go out as like faithful people of God, God transforms <laughs> life, not only ours, like, but mm -hmm. also the people that really need the gospel. So I think I really witnessed God's reality in that situation. And like, okay, I had that peace after a certain period of time. Like I needed to be strong for my family, you know, mm -hmm. like my family had to be strong for each other. But sure. there was a bigger, bigger purpose that was being fulfilled. And we saw that after that whole three months of trial. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's amazing about our stories of faith that our life is a story of faith. Mm -hmm. The life we now live is a story of faith. And inside that story, there are moments. Yeah. There are moments when God gets extremely personal mm -hmm. and we get really intimate with his faithfulness. Yeah. And we have a tendency to be microscopic. We just see the issue mm -hmm. from our own perspective. And we live in that microscopic understanding. But then with time 
And with God, we can be telescopic. We can step out of it. And then we see that this is not, it's like Genesis chapter 15, 19 and 20. You, you brothers didn't sell me into slavery. What Satan meant for evil, God meant for good to save many people alive. It gets telescopic. It gets wider than me. It's like it's bigger than me that whatever God has been faithful to me, but God is you in his desire to be faithful to me. He's revealed himself to many. Yeah. And a lot of our stories, I, I notice in all of our stories, mm. even in the little small ones, yeah. um, the ones that don't see, so, seem so significant, there is this picture of God revealing himself. Two things are happening. Mm. I am knowing God yeah. in my story of faith. But through my story of faith, God is also making himself known. Mm. And that's when it gets telescopic. That's when it gets wider. Like you said, souls get saved. Um, people are transformed and changed that you didn't, you never mind plan, you weren't even aware of. Yeah. You ever notice that, that in yeah. your story of faith, uh, um, you find out later that this this person also was aware, never mind you re recant telling the story, mm -hmm. but later on other people were somehow blessed, yeah. changed, ministered mm -hmm. to, but you just have your small part of the story. Mm -hmm. you, you got your nugget, but God's like, you're playing checkers. Mm -hmm. I'm playing three-dimensional chess. There's <laughs> all kinds of things I'm doing yeah. at this. Mm -hmm. change and bless many people's lives mm -hmm. you know it's amazing um mm -hmm. as we close the program and this is so rich i, I feel like we're just getting started actually pastor mm -hmm. adam maybe some final thoughts yeah i mean <clears throat> satan has done a masterful job at misrepresenting who god is he, mm -hmm. he hates faith he he mm -hmm. he um you know it's a, a world of unbelief but it's amazing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God really is pleased when his children um, are, are, you know, two verses come to mind. One is how little faith you have in me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the disciples. Like, what do, you, what do you think I am? Mm -hmm. Some kind of a, you know? And the other one is um, when, when they didn't have water, and uh, in the wilderness, you know, the Lord's testing their hearts. The things that came out of their mind were like, you know, he's trying to kill us, you know. Yeah. So the lack of faith really just reveals, you know, just a mm -hmm. like a like an incorrect picture of like who he is and, mm -hmm. and what he's accomplished. Maybe like not in our, even in our conscious mind, it's like deep down in there, you know. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, for the person who's saying, this is great, uh, that's awesome, but like, what about me? Like the simple action of putting yourself under just high dosages of truth really is, is the key to the word going in and reconstituting, you know, or replacing my natural thinking about who God is. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to trust someone who you know, who, who, is, who is trustworthy, who's lovable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that's it. Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Great program today. I love that. I like how Pastor Adam said that truth can stimulate my faith. <clears throat> Romans 10, 17 is indirectly saying the mm -hmm. truth because I trust what is what I know to be true. Yeah. And the more I know what's true about God, the stronger my faith, the more consistent my faith is. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if truth is consistent, faith follows consistency, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a great thought, Pastor Adam. Thank you, Lati. Thank you, Pastor Adam. Thank you, Akash. It's been a great mm -hmm. program. Missions Monday. Thank you. Getting ramped up here. It's getting warmer in Baltimore. Convention is not far away. Don't forget the 4th of May is the National Day of Prayer in America. Pray with us as we pray for our nation. And also, take some time today and rehearse stories of faith where God has been faithful to you and when you have responded to God by faith. And you'll find your faith will grow with God. God bless you. Amen. Until next time. Take care. Amen. Thank you, guys.